yes, right, hello everyone. I'm Connor, student David at Imperial. Uh, I'm a core developer in the FireDrop team, so I'm the second person to use the same slide deck in a row. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about PyOP3, which is the big thing that I'm doing in my PhD. So, quick overview. What is PyOP3? I'm going to give you an example, and then try and justify it. Why do, why do we need to have this new library? So, uh, what is PyOP3? Very, very briefly. It's a programming language for mathematicians. It comes with a compiler for that programming language. And this language lets you express how to read and write from complicated data structures. In a bit more detail, it's a domain-specific programming language embedded in Python. So it's a lot like UFL. Right? You write your, your UFL um, expression, your UFL program, and then we compile it and run it very quickly. So the compiler here, it's a just-in-time compiler. We go from the PyP3 expression to Loopy, which is an intermediate representation for generating code, and then we can generate C or CUDA or OpenCL. So we can get, um, we can deploy on CPUs and GPUs. Um, and sort of, I guess, quick thing about PyP3 um, is you, you could never need to create a text section ever again. That's one of my one of my promises. I don't think anyone likes it. I think it goes section. Okay, so why, why is it hard? Uh, so finite element codes have diverse and complicated data structures, and these data structures also need to be accessed in non-trivial ways. So I'm going to give you a, a simple example. Right, to start with, how do I write a Python 3 program? Well, there, there are two steps. You say, what's my data? And then, how do I loop over my data? How do I access the bits of data that I want at any particular time? So I'm going to give you a very simple example. I have a two-cell mesh. What does this look like? So I have my two-cell mesh here. I have applied a completely random numbering to it. So cell zero is actually the third thing. Cell one is the seventh thing. Yeah, a random numbering. How do I construct a data layout such that I can store degrees of freedom on different topological entities in this mesh? So this is some PyP3 code. Um, I have an axis, but basically I have two cells, five edges, and four vertices. Now, by default, um, this would be arranged such that cell zero, cell one, edge zero, edge one, and it would all be contiguous like that. But because we have this renumbering, which is really important for um, data locality reasons, um, we apply a permutation. If we do that, then the data structure that we get looks a bit like this. So if you imagine that we were storing one unknown for every cell, vertex, and edge, we would get one big array with 10 entries that would look like, not 10, uh, 11 entries that would look like this. The numbering is a bit confusing, but for example, cell zero, which is the blue zero, is in the, the fourth slot, so it's so the number three if we're using zero-based indexing. So it looks something like this. Right, that's a data layout for a two-cell mesh. Uh, now let's make it into a P3 function space. So here is the DOF layout P3. Um, so all that really matters here, so I'm not touching on orientations. That is the thing that I need to, need to get working. Uh, but vertices have one degree of freedom, edges have two, and cells have one. So I take my mesh axis from before, so I'll just go back. So I have my mesh axis, which remember looks like this. And I add three sub-axes. So my cells have one, one degree of freedom, edges have two, vertices have one. I do that, and then I get a data structure that looks something like this. Um, it's not the prettiest thing in the world. The top bit is the same as before. But uh, so the red ones are the edges, and there are two degrees of freedom for every edge. There's one degree of freedom for every vertex. This is another edge. And that's a cell. So I appreciate this is quite a confusing diagram, but I have one big array, and then I chop it up so I can look at one section and go, that's for an edge, that's for an edge, that's for a vertex, that's for a cell. And then within that, I could have you know my degrees of freedom for the edge contained within. So I'm just trying to break it up so it's a bit easier to see. Um, right, so we have our mesh data structure. We need to loop over it. So I'm going to do 
a simple PyOP2 style loop. So we have our mesh. Um, this one's bigger than two cells, um, but it's still P3. Um, so what we do is we loop over every single cell one by one. Um, so for this one, we then take all of the degrees of freedom contained within the, the closure. So all of the degrees of freedom that touch this cell. So we, it's um, 10, 10 entries. We pack it into a temporary that looks like this. So we've got the vertex degrees of freedom, the HD degrees of freedom and the cell one. We call a local kernel, which does some computation on this. And then we scatter the result back out to some global data structure. So this, is, this looks like this in sort of pseudo code. For every cell in the mesh, collect the degrees of freedom, call a local kernel, and then <coughs> scatter the results back. In PyP3, you would write this like this. I have a loop over cells from the mesh. I call some kernel. And as an argument to the kernel, I have my, my functions, where I pass in entries from the closure of that given cell. So that's the interface to this. Um, so I write this in Python 3. I've already defined what um, func zero is and all my data layouts. Uh, and now what we're able to do is generate code. So it's really ugly. I don't expect you to read it, really. Um, but we have our loop over cells. We have our temporary with 10, 10 numbers in it, declared up here. We pack our cell DOFs, we pack our edge DOFs, we pack our vertex DOFs, and then we call our kernel. And then we unpack it. <clears throat> so we're able to generate code. This is fast. Uh, and we can target this at C or CUDA, um, and it should work. What, what's the point? Um, right. PyP2 can already do this. Why do we need PyP3? Is it faster than PyP2? This is a question I get asked a lot of the time when I'm explaining what I do, and they say, why are you doing it? Does it make it faster? No. <laughs> is it at least as fast as PyP2? Not yet. So why is it useful? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason is um, composability. Right. So what is, why is composability important? So, performance optimization is not the main priority. What we want is expressibility. We want to be able to express a large range of problems in this domain specific language. So, PyP2 has several limitations. We can only do one loop, one kernel. Um, we can't do map composition. So, we can't do closure composed with anything else to get the adjacent degrees of freedom. And things like extruded meshes require invasive code changes. It's very involved. There's a lot of special purpose code in PyOP2 and also in Fire So what we want to be able to do is do more, but with, few, like, with fewer lines of code. If we get the abstractions right, then things get very easy to express. So just as you know, examples, the compiler for PyOP3 that I've written is about 1,000 lines of code. PyOP2 is quite a bit more because there are special cases for things. It's a bit more complicated. Uh, and extruded is simpler. Just, just for some examples. So I'm now going to talk through composability things that PyP3 can do. Map composition uh, is not quite as cool as some of the rest of it, in my opinion, but we can do composition of maps. So imagine we have a facet in our mesh. I think you might need to explain the walls because I think that uh, some people are not going to understand what you keep writing on the board. Okay. Uh, so the walrus <laughs> is an assignment expression, is yeah. that right? Um, so I want to loop over mesh.interior facets, but I also want facet to be a variable that I can then use later on in the line, right? So I defer it here and I use it there. Um, and it just, it looks nicer than an alternative, basically. Um, it's called the walrus because it's supposed to look like the tusks. Like eyes and tusks. That you've got ten now. Well, you've used ten. Cool. I am the walrus. <laughs> uh, right. So we want to have two maps. So the support of a facet is the cells that touch the facet, and then we want the closure. We want all the dots that touch those. So we can now. This is a <coughs> pipe two cannot do this. We can compose maps to give us the right degrees of freedom that we want. Uh, other applications would probably be things like multi-grid, where we might have a fine cell, we want to go to the core cell, and then get all the degrees of freedom on that. 
So again, we can compose these maps. Uh, I want to talk about loop and kernel composition. So I'm using PC patch as an example. So PC patch is, quite, is an advanced preconditioner that we have, and the implementation is very, very complicated. But an idea for something, you know, something that I'd like to do with PyP3 is to is to implement it. So PC patch has certain sort of characteristics. It has two loops. So you loop over the vertices in your mesh, and then you need to loop over all the cells around each of the vertices. So we can compose loops. We can have a loop over the vertices, and then we can have a loop over the cells that are um, in the star of that vertex. We then can call multiple kernels because we need to assemble the matrix and we need to assemble the vector. Uh, and then we have other kernels outside that we, you know, to solve the linear system that we want. So that is an example of loop composition, kernel composition, that I'm quite keen to try out. Um, we could try and rewrite Slate, because Slate, again, is very similar. You have lots of kernel composition going on. Uh, and also, excitingly, we can try and do some, some tiling optimizations and move the loops around for performance reasons. So if we have um, like an interior facet integral, we might want to tile our domain just so we get nice data locality. Right, so we have loop, map, kernel, composition, but we also have complicated data structures to deal with. So, I'm going to give some examples of some complicated data structures that work. We can do extruded meshes. So we have our base mesh, shown here in red, and then we can have our degrees of freedom stored in the columns. So, these are our cells and uh, vertices of the base mesh, and then these are the degrees of freedom stored vertically. I can represent data structures like this in Pi p 3 It's very simple, straightforward to do. We can also do ragged data structures. So, um, I just, you have variable inner dimensions, basically. Uh, and this is good for things like variable layer extrusion, where you might have a different number of columns across your domain. Uh, and also, this is cool for things like particle and cell. I've been speaking to Will Saunders about this. Uh, so that's another application for this. Um, I haven't gotten very far with this one, but we can do sparsity in Python 3 as well. It's very similar to ragged um, because you know the number of unknowns uh, per row in sparse matrix might not necessarily be the same. Um, we can do sparsity, and we can do it for arbitrary sparsity, arbitrary sparse tensors, and it should just work. Um, and the last last example of a sort of nice data layout thing that we can do is what I call swapping axes. So imagine that we have a mixed space. Um, V0 and V1, and we're storing our degrees of freedom separately. So by default, FireDrake will do this. And sometimes you might want to look at the blue and the red together uh, in your kernel. So you might want to put the spaces inside the, the mesh points. So that will give you a vector that will look like this. And you can do this transparently in Pi 3 Right. So just in summary, PyP3 is a domain-specific language slash compiler framework for writing kernels with non-trivial data access patterns. It can do everything PyP2 can do and more, and it's still a work in progress. Um, thank you. Any questions for Conan? Uh, hand. You, you mentioned this targeting looping. But also, then it, you just showed it showing C code. Uh, yes. Explain more about like how loopy would be helpful here. So I have a a top level loop expression, mm -hmm. and I traverse the loop expression, and I make loopy code. I generate a loopy kernel, mm -hmm. and then I basically say, "Hey, give me C code. Hey, give me CUDA code." Yeah. Uh, and it's it's pretty trivial to do either one. Um, I need to, you need to do certain transformations for GPUs to get the right um, loop dimensions for the, the threads. But um, I make loopy and then hand everything off to them to make the C. And you keep the, the, the composability of being able to kind of swap out loops as you, as is this, as the, the, the DSL describes. Yep. Okay. So that's what you have to Yeah. Yes. So what do you exactly, so how do you go to CUDA and then as a feedback question from that, have to consider, for example, 
using Kafka's abstractions. Because I mean, the way you you generate code, you probably also tell to generate Kafka's kernels, right? Sorry, Kafka's. Kafka's in the abstraction library for CUDA, which which gives you clear performance. I, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I basically just tell Leapy to do it for me. <laughs> yeah. um, kernels come in Leapy, right? So, so uh, the, we should discuss MLIR later on because there are definitely alternatives yeah, to the That's what MLIR is. It's like a library which is just more body space for like linear algebra application and you basically tell the computer compiler to construct this kernel. But this is a linear algebra. Yeah, we have, we have complicated data access patterns and kernels. Uh, okay. uh, back, well, uh, the, the underlying memory storage for multi drive. Yep. Do you have the access descriptors to decide which device cuts off the load that you have? Uh, yeah, well, we've been working on doing this with. Jack, and actually, you know what? He's talking about that next. Um, <laughs> Ask Jack. So, yeah, we should be talking about that. Okay. Yeah, Lars? Yeah, I think that was really cool. I recall we've written at least one proposal that has been unsuccessfully unfunded to do this in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one kind of tiny little question. When you were attaching degrees of freedom to your mesh access, yes. uh, can you? different numbers of degrees of freedom to each entity individually of like XNs. Uh, so, for, so some cells get three, some cells get four. Or know? like one of those edges gets three and the other two get two. Uh, well, that would sort of fall into like a ragged diff layer, I think. Okay. Or, so. or you could have your, your two edges and your one edges. So you, you can distinguish and it's either a ragged thing which is more Dynamic and runtime, and you have to look it up, or it can be compile time known like this. Sort of thing. Um, Why are there strings in the interface of the data? Uh, I haven't. I need to think about temporaries and how we deal with them because yeah. they're, they're temporary values in the uh, mm -hmm. do, 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 do. <clears throat> just here. Yeah. So I don't. I haven't provided for that in the interface yet. My temporaries appear automatically when I. Pass and things like this. Uh, Would that might just be another wall? So there's like match up. Yeah, it could be. By yeah. string. By string, yeah. I'd, I'd have some like extra argument going here, going like max temp equals. Well, you, allocate could, no, you could just do it when you introduce it, right? So you could, you could take, replace this with max yeah. equals temp. Mm. And then, uh, and now max a defined symbol, and you can use map further down. Yes. Is access a standard computer science term for that uh, kind of structure? Is there, is there, I, 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 I don't think it's a very standard structure because I have my a tree <coughs> and it's mm -hmm. not normally a tree. So I, I chose it up here. Right, but you're, you're thinking about it because you're kind of going along a line in, in data memory. Yeah, <laughs> and like in very simple cases, it looks like a monkey thing, and you can, monkey has a lot of technology I borrowed right. from yeah. so they have a, yeah. an access. So it's the hardest part of computer science is knowing things. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> if you want to reach an element, this is the place where I have to draw on this, like adding add individual freedom to some elements. Uh, you, you shouldn't need to do any of this. Um, there's sort of FIAT and FIAT. It's quite involved, I believe, you know, to add a new element, but that's separate to this. Oh, oh. So, what doesn't work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I know how to get them to work. It's just an awful lot of work. Um, I don't do matrix assembly yet. I don't do parallel yet. I don't do extruded meshes yet. Um, a lot of the composition stuff works. So I, I've been working very hard on the sort of fundamental abstractions, um, like the code that Jack just removed from the screen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Opportunity. Um, so I think I'm very, very close to having a language that I'm really, really happy with and can compose in all the right ways and generate code that looks right. And then, fingers crossed, it'd be quite easy to plug it together in the right ways. Um, I have a follow-up question. Are the things that you can do in Pi over 2 that you can't do in Pi over 3? 
Um, <laughs> so so um, there are things not yet implemented, but no, everything should definitely be possible to do. Um, Basically, because like, what we're doing is massively generalizing maps. But the specific case of maps that exist in our open 2 is just the simplest case of this. Is that where you would do the first kind of implementation? You just replace maps with five? <laughs> Kind of have to replace the whole five for two thing at the same time, which is why it's a little bit stressful. It's like <laughs> yeah. Plug it replacement. So, sometime in the next few months, we're going to do the mother of all changes to fire. This drops into one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is probably the biggest one since we yeah. deleted fluidity. Um, took half a million lines out of the code. Um, okay, I think it's time to move on. Thank, Thank you. you. Come on. Thank you.